Hi, and thank you for joining us for the International Symposium on Human Identifications video series for this year. Joining us today is Ed Green. Ed is a professor of biomolecular engineering at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a co-founder of Estrella Forensics. Ed, thank you so much for joining us today. And why don't you start by telling us a little bit about Estrella? So Estrella is a small operation that was uh, born out of the work that my lab uh, started doing in uh, forensics, mostly from uh, DNA uh, from rootless hairs. There are, as you know for sure, um, many crime scenes, many cases where the only uh, evidence that might yield DNA is rootless hair. That's been a very challenging sample for most forensic assays. And we've developed some great technology for getting DNA out of rootless hair, converting it into uh, sequence libraries we can use to learn the DNA sequence information, and then using this information to get genetic profiles of a different type, SNP profiles that can then be used for forensic genetic genealogy. That part of it, we don't do at all. We simply uh, get the genotype files. Um, this, when it's, uh, when we first kind of put all of this together, there was, um, uh, a trickle of uh, cases coming in that we could handle in the lab, but it became clear over a little bit of time that uh, there's just no way to do this in an academic lab in a way that is reasonable and responsive and professional uh, for the demand that was there. So um, we moved that uh, operation into um, a commercial entity, Estrella Forensics, and have fantastic people there now that do this in a, um, in a much better way than we could really do in an academic lab is kind of a little side project in the, in the back of the lab. Um, now it's done in a way that we can all be uh, happy with and rely on. Okay, that sounds very exciting. Um, working with rootless hair samples, let's talk a little bit about that and some of the challenges associated with that. Sure. Um, so rootless hair samples are uh, perhaps one of the most misunderstood uh, sample types in forensics. The, um, if you watch the TV shows, they will say that there's no DNA in hair shafts. And that is um, it's actually not true at all. It it's, couldn't be further from the truth. But the, um, there's a reason why there is this misconception out there. And I think most people in the forensics community know this um, for a long time and still including today, the most common forensics assay is a PCR-based assay to amplify STR markers. In fact, in the field of forensics, a genetic profile or a DNA profile or a, um, a fingerprint is pretty much synonymous with this assay, this one single assay, looking at um, STR uh, links from PCR. And it turns out that the DNA that you can get out of hair shafts generally fails on this assay or just barely works, um, often working uh, just well enough to let you know that eh, maybe there's some DNA in there, but we're not really getting a, a useful profile or it just fails entirely. Um, so that observation over and over and over again kind of led the uh, conventional wisdom to be that there's not much DNA there or, or there's no DNA there. Turns out it's just not true at all. It's just completely 100% false. There's plenty of DNA there. It's just in pieces that are too short to do um, PCR amplification on. And so you gotta do something else. And that something else is uh, something that we're very interested in. I run a lab that uh, deals with ancient DNA, DNA from um, remains that might be tens of thousands of years old. And the DNA is there in small quantities and uh, very short, very fragmented. That's how DNA is in hair. So we've got this great technology for converting short small amounts of DNA into libraries that can be sequenced. That libraries that can be sequenced sounds, you know, cryptic, you know, what is that? Is that a difficult thing? Conceptually, it's very simple. A library that can be sequenced just means you stick adapters on the end, little piece of DNA at the beginning, little piece of DNA at the end, so it can go on the sequencer. 
And that's it. Uh, we have a very efficient way of slapping those adapters on so that it can be sequenced. And then from this information, read the DNA sequence, make a genotype file, and um, then the magic people downstream of us who look at this and um, build out trees and do the genetic genealogy, all of that happens and the police work happens. Um, but that's, that's what our part is, getting DNA out of rootless hairs. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, it was <laughs> about DNA and uh, hair. Yeah, uh, small amounts, super fragmented, but absolutely there. That is fascinating. And no, you were absolutely answering the question. Um, but I, I think people would also like to hear about like how it's applied in particular cases, if there are ones you can talk about. I know we interviewed Barbara Ray Ventner last year about her work on the Golden State Killer case. Um, and I think you work together. Okay. Yeah, Barbara and I uh, do work together. We've worked together on lots of cases. Uh, she's fantastic. She, um, uh, more than even uh, working together, she is kind of why we're doing this um, at all. Um, I got into the forensics uh, kind of um, uh, sideways. There was a, a little girl who was dug up in a, a casket underneath a house in San Francisco where some homeowner was doing work and they were out of town. The construction workers came in digging a post hole and chunk hit a casket, pull this thing up. Who is this girl? What's going on? Um, it was a super interesting kind of long ordeal. Um, not really a forensics case, but it was someone who, you know, died tragically, but not criminally. And um, they assembled a team, brought us in to do the um, hair work, try to get DNA out of her hair, and uh, hopefully that would be useful in figuring out who she was. Um, super long project. Uh, Alyssa Davey was the person who kind of brought all of this together uh, and figured out who the girl was, identified a living relative, and tested DNA, and that was all great. So reburied this poor little girl. Turns out she had died back in 1876, and they buried her in a cemetery in San Francisco when they moved all of the bodies out of all the cemeteries down to um, Daly City. They just missed one. It was a huge operation and they were not as thorough as they should have been. So uh, missed this little girl and uh, did that. So this was kind of an interesting project. It was on the local news out here. Uh, turns out that local uh, is the same for me and Barbara, the uh, central coast of California. She saw that and in typical Barbara fashion, uh, just called me on the phone and uh, said something to the effect of, that was cute, uh, would you like to do real work? And um, we had a conversation and um, she got me uh, involved and um, it's been great. It's been great working with Barbara. We've done uh, many cases together. Um, when I say together, we do a very defined part of it and have a very defined endpoint. She has a very defined part of it, which doesn't really overlap with our part at all. We get it right up to the genotype file and then um, deliver it to law enforcement or Barbara or whoever the genealogist is handling it and they go do their thing. Um, but it's been great. Yeah, Barbara is wonderful. That's fantastic. I love that story about how she called you. What a great partnership and that's what a great <laughs> way to start it. <laughs> yeah, and if you talk to her, uh, she'll say that she discovered me, uh, which is um, oddly flattering, you know, to be a person who was discovered. Um, Anyway, yeah, I like working with Barbara. I love that. Um, <laughs> well, we discovered you, I know at least a couple years ago, we did speak to you about some work you were doing on Neanderthal genes. Is there anything you want to talk about? Any updates there? Did that influence anything you're doing today? Was that entirely separate? Just, yeah. Yeah, so a uh, long time ago, I uh, worked my, you know, my whole life was all around getting DNA uh, out of Neanderthals and doing analysis of that, my postdoc work and um, 
We still have an interest in this for sure in the lab. I, uh, the big thing we have now, we'll have a paper soon um, looking at the human genetic variation and Neanderthal genetic variation to pinpoint places in the human genome where we don't, no one has the Neanderthal gene. So it's you know kind of known that Neanderthals and humans admixed, Many humans carry legacy of this admixture, genes from Neanderthals at particular places, but nobody's got too much of this, and it's kind of randomly scattered across the genome, um, the different Neanderthal bits. So a uh, question that we wanted to answer was, well, what about uh, the places where nobody has the Neanderthal gene? Um, what genes are these? under the hypothesis that the places where nobody has what Neanderthals had on offer might underlie the important human specific genes, things that make us uniquely human. And when Neanderthal genes came back in, regions of the genome uh, that, that maybe were different, maybe we had some novelty there that uh, their version wasn't good enough anymore we could pinpoint these. So uh, we've got some uh, uh, computational machinery that finds these in a, a very efficient way. And um, a big new interest in the lab is working with these, uh, and this is gonna be weird, uh, brain organoids, these little uh, brains in a dish that you can grow and using CRISPR technology to, when you find these regions, the places where all humans are different from Neanderthals, to go in and snip that out, snip in the Neanderthal version, the archaic version, and see how it uh, changes the little brain in a dish. Wow, that is that is like next level. That's fast. That's <laughs> it sounds crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, most of the super cool parts of that are you know done with collaborators, uh, Mircha Teodorescu, Sophie Salama, people who. Um, are really expert in those parts of it, but it's a good team. It's going to be a, a fun project to work on. That is very exciting. Maybe that segue is into kind of the final wrap-up question. Um, you know, what's next for you? What do you see for the future in your field? Where is this all going? I, and we're asking you to guess a little bit, but... <laughs> yeah, um, well, like Yogi Berra said, it's hard to predict things, especially about the future. And uh, I, I don't know. I just hope that uh, um, that it doesn't all blow up. You know, the um, genetic genealogy, forensic genetic genealogy. I've seen firsthand how this can be a, a really wonderful force for for good and for justice and um, solve really high profile, important cases, cases that really need to be solved. It can do that. Um, and with that power, uh, we head you know, down a path that kind of has blinders on that it's possible to do that. So let's do that. There are bigger issues. There are deeper issues about the um, data, databases, how they are accessible, how they ought to be accessible. Um, and I don't claim to have you know, any deep wisdom on this, but um, generally it's good if policy doesn't get out too far ahead of society's collective understanding of what's going on. And we get in trouble when, when that happens, when the either scientists or policymakers or anybody really who has their hand on the lever of power does something beyond everybody else's ability to understand what's being done. We, we shouldn't do that. We should, um, you know, try to do things like this, do outreach, explain the technology, explain what's going on, good and bad, warts and all, everything, and then let us collectively as a society figure out how this ought to go, what should we do, and, um, you know, step slowly. I know that people, practitioners of this, get frustrated when lay people say something that betrays misunderstanding. 
And then they say, well, why should we listen to people who don't know anything about this? The other side of that is the, the lay people who don't know anything about this, they are eventually going to decide how this is uh, going to be done or not. So let's just all be on the same team like we are all on the same team. We all want the same thing. Everybody wants, you know, this to turn out well. Everybody wants there to be, um, you know, good, uh, fair, um, powerful, not abused tools of law enforcement to do their job. And, you know, we, I, I think we can get there as long as people um, continue to have patience and continue to uh, make this uh, an effort that we're all participating in and all thinking about and all can weigh in on. And no one feels rightly or wrongly that they are being taken advantage of. That is a fantastic answer. And I think especially perfect given the world that we're living in right now with COVID and everything we're dealing with. I just, I, I Yeah, can it. we live in a different world? I'm kind of getting tired of this one. I, I agree. I really, I miss people. I mean. <laughs> yes, yeah. Zoom's horrible. I, I mean, know. You know. What can you do? It's, yeah, right. What can you do? Ed, thank you so much. This is really wonderful. I know how busy you are, so we so appreciate you taking time to talk to us. Oh, this was fun, Laura. Anytime. Thank you very much. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.